employment at cost, including the, including the labor from the Eagle Scout project. And that was a blessing because I was able to be fiscally responsible there. And you can see my Eagle Scout project on the corner of Jackson and Wilson, Jackson Street and Wilson Avenue, across from Walgreens in Oakwood Cemetery. And I know many of you were there for the dedication ceremony. A little bit about me before I, I do talk. I have a I have a personal connection to the topic that I'll be just discussing today. And the topic is, you, you may have read it in the flyer and the newsletter that you have, but my topic is the impact of the UH-1 Huey in the Vietnam War. Well, my grandfather served a tour in Vietnam and he, he flew the Huey. And the total number of men who were saved by Hueys and were, were pulled out of the combat zones at Hueys was 900,000. And I have a personal connection to that because my grandfather was one of those guys doing that. And that's a blessing for me. And I noticed, too, when we did, when we did the Pledge of Allegiance, everybody stood. And that's, just a, that, that's basic. That's basic respect. And one of the reasons that I see that is from my grandfather. I realized what he went through. And he did that for, for, for the reason for me to be here and for you to be able to be here in this country and for the rule of law that we have. I reference rule of law. That's a big part of big part of my life. I officiate baseball and in baseball you either right or wrong, you're safe or out. And that's that's one of the aspects of rule of law is in my life, but it's also in my life in my future career aspirations. I'm in my fifth semester at Montlaw right now and I'll be graduating with three associate's degrees in political science, pre-law, and communications. And I'm currently working on the Judd Matheny for Congress campaign, about 30, 35 hours a week. And we're traveling across the sixth district, which is the 22nd biggest district in the country. And we're traveling across that district and running hard. But that's, that, that's something, too, where I look at government and I see the shape our country's in, and I realize I want to be a part of the solution. I've applied, I interviewed Monday at the Rachel Jackson Building in Nashville for an internship next session at the State Capitol. And hopefully, if things go well, I'll be working for Senator Mark Pody, who will be taking Senator Beaver's seat from the Wilson County area and working for him in that senatorial seat in Nashville. But I will move on to my topic today, but I did want to cover that just about me beforehand. And then also, once I finish this hopefully get this internship and finish at the, at the Capitol this spring. I'll be continuing my academic life at Trevecca Nazarene University in Nashville, and I'll be a student assistant baseball coach there. And I've been a student assistant at Montlo for two years these past two, these past two seasons, and I've had a blast with that. And that's the only way I could have been part of a college baseball program, but I'll be continuing at Trevecca and Nashville. And Majoring. Unfortunately, they don't have a public policy major. They just have that as a minor. So I'm going to do a business administration major with a beefed up public policy as my minor. The Huey's, for its first flight was in 1956. And the initial intent of the Huey was just to be a medical evacuation helicopter. It wasn't intended to be what it quickly devolved into, which was a utility helicopter. You had generals who flew in it. It, it was armed for purposes not only of self-defense, but there were also Hueys that sought out enemy positions and were hunt, hunt, hunt and kill Hueys, and their intent was not to haul troops, which was my grandfather's role. He was assigned to the 101st Airborne Division, and I've heard stories from guys who were in the 101st who he may or may not have, have flown, but I've heard stories from those guys of they heard the womp, 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 and that's it. I'm not, I'm not talking about Charlie Brown, I'm talking about the helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's the sound of the Huey blades cut through the sky. And those guys heard that, and they knew, they knew they were going to be okay, and they knew they were going to be in their bed that night. It entered production in 1960, and since then, more than 16,000 Hueys have been produced. And those Hueys were, have not just been used for U.S. service, but you, I'll cover later how they've been used for foreign countries have used our technology. It, imagine that, a foreign country thinking that the, something the United States did was something to imitate and do it for themselves. Can you imagine that? It was originally de designated the UH-1 Iroquois, but 
as a result of the HU1 sound, it was quickly switched to UH1, and the nickname Huey was developed. It's entered lore because it, it entered the lore of the Vietnam War. Every time you look at it, you watch a documentary of the Vietnam War, and I, I watched bits and pieces of a few in preparation for this. You you hear the sound of the Huey, and you you see it when you Google Vietnam War, and you click on images. There's multiple images of the Huey, and it's become iconic with Vietnam. It was produced by Bell and was tested in Fort Worth, Texas in the late 50s and early 60s. Well, my grandfather, I've, I've heard stories from my grandfather when he was going through flying school to learn to fly the Huey, and he was in Fort Hood, Texas. And that's close to Bell's main manufacturing hub there in Fort Worth. And I've, I've heard many stories from my grandfather. He actually, there was one where they were lost, and the, the avionics from the, the Huey couldn't tell them where they needed to go. Their navigation system was messed up. So he landed at a farmhouse, and the farmer came out with a map, and he said, uh, for where'd you guys come from? There's you know, no roads in my house. You know, it's all ranch land. He said, well, we, we fly a helicopter. And the guy kind of looked around. He said, well, I'll tell you where you need to go. He said, but that thing's pretty scary. <laughs> <laughs> Originally, the Hueys were more similar in size, but eventually they were modified to fit more troops. They were Initially, they were streamlined like the Black Hawk that we see today, with the UH-60 Black Hawk, which took the Huey's role. It's long and rectangular and rather skinny. But in Vietnam, it was quickly developed that they needed to have more room to fit more troops in the Huey. So they added 41 inches into the cab, not, not the right word, but to, to the, the cockpit Good of the enough. Huey, and fit four more seats in there to hold soldiers. So that included the total number of people that could be hauled, hauled in the Huey was 15, and that was including the four crew members. The crew chief, who also served as one of the gunners, a 50 caliber machine gun on one side, and the other side was a door gunner, and then the co-pilot and the pilot, and he'd haul 11 guys. I'm sure with extenuating circumstances, sometimes they hauled more than 11. The Marine Corps followed the Army. I'm sure my grandfather will be the first one to tell you anything good the Army does, the Marine Corps is going to have to emulate. But the Marine Corps started development in 1962, and then the Air Force soon followed. It entered service with the aforementioned 101st Airborne Division, the Screaming Eagles from Clarksville and Fort Campbell, and then it also entered for its intended purpose, which was medical services. So it also entered with the 82nd Medical Division, and that was the actual purpose of the Huey before it devolved to other uses. Soldiers were quick to modify, of course. You, anytime you look at the military, there's always going to be things that once they get into combat and once they're used, the soldiers are going to think, oh, that's, that's something that I could do better on because the developers, they're, they're not on the ground with us. So they were quickly modified. They atta attached grenade launchers, 40 millimeter grenade launchers, which could put out 400 grenades per minute into an area, and I actually watched a video on YouTube of that, and you could save 400 grenades per minute, but until you watch the devastation of firepower by that, it's, it's pretty impossible to imagine. And then they also had rock, rocket launchers and machine guns on board. The nickname for troop-carrying Hueys were slicks, and I, that was not the first time I heard that term when I came across that in my research. I've, I've heard my grandfather talk about slicks before. Another intent of the Huey, another purpose that was used for, was for, for transportation. That was one of the real utility uses, was transportation, hauling goods and supplies. I, I remember hearing of a fire base that was on the top of a mountain in Vietnam. And a fire base was isolated a lot of times. It was close to enemy territory. It would be cut off from resupply except by the air, except from the Huey and they have 105 millimeter howitzers and 155 millimeter howitzers, and their range could be 18 miles around the fire base to project fire for our guys on the ground. And my grandfather was flying a Huey that was taking supplies to this fire base. Well, it was socked in, and if any of you are familiar with aviation terminology, socked in means this fog's, fog's at a high level, it's raining, it's, it's misty, you don't know where you're going. And he had to get these supplies on top of the mountain. So in the, the cockpit of the Huey, the base of it, there's 
a glass a, 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 on, on the front end of the nose is glass and it's rounded. And he said, well, I'm going to fly up against the mountain until I see the trees through the glass at the bottom of my cockpit on the other side of my feet. And I'm going to tilt my helicopter like this and go up the top of the mountain. And eventually, I'm sure, I can't imagine, you know, I'm driving in, you know, I, as southerners, we panic driving in half an inch of snow, but <laughs> he's flying up a mountain in an enemy territory in snow and or in sleet and fog, and I think that might be a little bit more adventurous than driving on half an inch of snow for us southerners. <laughs> and I do say that, us, uh, us southerners, I do consider myself a southerner. My dad was born in New Jersey, but he met my mom, and you can forgive me later for that, but he was, he was born in New Jersey, and my grandfather's last post of duty was Fort Dix, New Jersey. And that's where he met my mother. And thank, I, I thank the Lord every day, and I, I mean that literally, that I am being raised in the South because I, I could have picked a better place to live. So in 1967, the Air Force used them for special operations, inserting and extra, extracting reconnaissance teams, psychological operations where they fly over with leaflets or with speakers, telling the, the, telling, telling the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong that there was no point in fighting the war, it was useless, the war was over. And then they also used them for covert operations in Laos and Cambodia, you know, those operations where we had President Nixon telling the country that we we weren't there, and then you had to be a guy listening to the radio over there, hearing the president saying, oh, don't worry, our guys aren't there, and they're flying operations in there every day. So the, the Hueys were those helicopters that were used for that. And I know y'all will remember that, but. I unfortunately was not a live officer during that point. And then many Hueys were used as gunships and providing aerial support to the Navy river boats. Which, when you think of river, you know, you think of the Cumberland River in Nashville, a big wide open area, cliffs. Well, the rivers, the rivers of Vietnam weren't like that. They're narrow, large grass on the side, and they used the Hueys as gunships to provide air support because often the Viet Cong would sneak up close to the, the edge of the river and hit our gunboats, our Navy ships. So the Hueys would be on top and be able to provide, provide aerial support there. The Australian Air Force, Air Force used Hue Hueys up until 1989, and that American inter innovation that we can be proud of. And the Australian Air Force also used them in, in Vietnam, and they developed them under license in Melbourne, Australia. And then they were also used for peacekeeping operations in Egypt, on the Sinai Canal and Sinai Peninsula area when Israel and Egypt were in territorial war over that area. Other countries that used this technology include New Zealand, Germany, Japan, and Japan used them for disaster relief. Pakistan had four Hueys, and they were heavily modified. But Pakistan had four Hueys. And then another country is New Zealand as well that used them. Pakistan used them in 2005 and 2010 during the floods in Pakistan. And Japan used them to observe the Fukushima nuclear plant after it erupted as a result of the tsunami in Japan. Other countries that bought helicopters that were built under license from these larger countries include El Salvador, Lebanon, Argentina, and Israel. And they're also used up until this day by the Drug Enforcement Agency for drug raids in Afghanistan. According to the Vietnam Helicopter Pilots Association, which my grandfather is a proud member, 3,305 Hueys were lost during Vietnam. And not a lot of those, not all of those were lost in combat. Some of them, when the American forces were pulling out of Vietnam, there were so many Hueys coming off the coast of Vietnam and landing on aircraft carriers and support ships, there was no room for them. And I've, I've been shown pictures of Hueys being pushed off the flight decks of these carriers to make room for more Hueys. So not all the Hueys that were lost were directly due to combat. The unofficial number of pilots and crew who gave their lives in the Huey is 2,202. Uh, that's unofficial. The official number is larger. The official number is 2,704 pilots and crew who were killed while in Hueys. I mentioned earlier how 900,000 Americans were pulled out of those combat zones in, he in Huey. Recently, my grandfather and I, we went to Washington, D.C. with our family. And I was able to see the Vietnam Wall with him, which was a very moving experience. 
but we were invited to go to a reunion of ground guys of the infantry, and they're affectionately called the Grunts. And when he found, when they found out my grandfather was a helicopter pilot, the look on their faces. I don't know if I could ever replicate that look because they realized my grandfather was the guy pulling them out. It meant a lot to me because I was able to see guys who said, hey, and I was younger at that point, it was seven years ago, but I was able to see guys who say, hey, you know what, your grandfather's a hero. And I always knew he was, but to see these grizzled guys in their motorcycle jackets, beards, and their patches from Vietnam say, hey, you know what, I'm here because your grandguy's like your grandfather. That meant a whole lot to me. The lore of the Huey continues on in America, and not just through events like this, but there's many monuments with Hueys. There's some Hueys that are mounted outside of military bases and displayed there. And actually, in 2015, there was a bill introduced by a congressman from Nevada. You know, everything comes back to, to government for me, so I was able to find, find this. A bill was introduced. December 18, 2015, by a congressman from Nevada. And that bill would direct the Department of the Army to place in Arlington National Cemetery a memorial honoring pilots and crew who served in the military during the Vietnam War in Hueys. And that act was called the Vietnam Helicopter Crew Memorial Act. And that bill's been stuck in the Senate for a year and a half. So I'm not sure where that bill's going. But that bill was did, did pass the House with no opposition and is in the Senate. I want to thank you for letting me come today and share about an aspect of Vietnam that's more personal to me, and I've explained why. But I really appreciate that, taking the chance on, you know, it got the young guy to come talk to you. But uh, Miss Sandy did invite me. I'm a member of First Baptist Church on Grundy Street. And Miss Sandy did invite me, and then also Miss Forrester. She's been a member of First Baptist Church for years, and I walked in today. I didn't expect to see Miss Forrester, but uh, it, it, is, it is good to see. You. And then uh, I didn't know Miss Dayton was going to be here as well, and I do appreciate that. Miss Duncan, she was not my kindergarten te kindergarten teacher, but she was across the hallway from my kindergarten teacher, and I, I heard all the stories of the fun the kids were having in Miss Duncan's class. But, I was never able to participate in that. And also, Miss Tammy Kidd there in the back, I've umpired for her son Elijah for years. And Elijah, uh, I'll, probably not because of me, but Elijah does like to, to dress up as an umpire, and he'll come watch games. And he'll come and watch games. I, I don't think it's because of me. Probably some of my other umpires did a better job. But Elijah does come watch games, and in his umpire uniform, we've given him an official umpire and a half. But I do appreciate you for letting me come today and talk to you, and I'm going to zip right out and go to class. <laughs>